Next few minutes, uh, we are going to spend uh, learning about teaching and learning. I want you to know where I am heading with this um, uh, discussions today, so uh, you stay with me. A few quotations here, uh, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher uh, demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. The inspiration is very important to uh, students uh, to get inspired. If you inspire students, sky is the limit what they do. If the learner motivated, inspired, there is no stopping him or her. And when you get engaged and motivated, then you learn. That's where the learning happens. Uh, let me be blunt about these things, that the content, the idea of content only in the classroom uh, is out. If I come here all day, four hours, lecture about the Middle East content, facts, you will leave the room shaking your head that why did I waste your time all these uh, four hours? Because you can find these things in Google. You can find these things in the internet. So I want to uh, teach you about rule of engagement, involvement, so you can be a better learner. The study shows that average attention of students is about 18 minutes. If you can't keep that first 18 minutes, you lose them. I'm the same way. If I go to a meeting, first few minutes, they can't grab my attention. I'm going to leave or um, do something else during that meeting because that's just human being. You gotta engage them. After 18 minutes, you lose them. And probably you have heard this quotation called, give a man a fish and uh, he will eat for a day and teach him how to fish, he will eat for uh, uh, his uh, lifetime. So it's better to teach you about uh, doing research, learning styles, more so than giving you facts all day. And uh, this can be a little bit comic and um, laughing matter that they give a man a fish and he will eat for a day, teach him how to fish, and uh, he will uh, sit uh, in a boat and uh, drink a beer all day. So you can see how it works in Texas. <laughs> Students don't care how much you know until uh, they know how much you care. This is a quotation from me, uh, you can use it, that uh, we are living in a greatest uh, teachable moment in human history, and the question is, are we taking advantage of it? I believe that teaching is way up and way out, and uh, teaching is giving, giving uh, what I know, what I can do, and what I believe in. Learning comes from the passion, not the discipline. So almost the entire sum of human knowledge is available to every human being on, on the planet by Googling. You already have that gadget in your hand. I saw most of you have it. You are connected to the billion, billions of pages of information in your hand. A quotation from uh, President Obama that we are the nation that put uh, cars in driveways computers in offices, and uh, the nation of Edison, Wright Brothers, of Google, Facebook, uh, Steve Jobs, and you name it. Um, and uh, in the United States, in innovations does not just um, change our lives, it is the how we make living. Look at all these big innovations like Google, like Facebook, like um, uh, Apple, why does it happen in the United States? It doesn't happen in Europe, it doesn't happen in China, it doesn't happen in any part of the Africa. Something must be good about the United States, about education, about the learning. So this is something that you have to pay attention. We complain all the time about education in the United States, but yet, look at uh, here, that we have uh, these uh, uh, innovations that change everybody's uh, lives, uh, yours and mine. And using the social media is a very powerful outlet uh, to use uh, of politics and the US politics, Middle Eastern politics, affected by the power of social media and applications and the tools. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time with the US social media, then talk about the United uh, Middle East. So since uh, most of you are taking Texas politics, US government, and uh, I want to also enlighten you about these things that we are discussing. 
and then I will shift to Middle East so you can see their relevance and learn more. Let's uh, discuss a few things about the social power, uh, social of, um, the power of social media uh, of the United States. Take a look at the presidential election, how Obama won using the digital and social media. I assure you that if there was no Facebook, no uh, social media in 2008, Obama would not have been our president because things were different, operated differently. And 85% of Obama's funds were raised through the social networking. From social media savvy to YouTube, social networking, Obama has navigated the Web 2. It's called Web 2.0. I have a lecture on that. Uh, uh, that turned into a major force within um, his campaign or any politician's campaign nowadays. He's not the only one. And the number of friends in the Facebook, 3.3 uh, million, probably is more than that now. And the groups, applications, uh, you can see the impact on po in politics. That this is a new word. It's called YouTubification. You can use that and impress people. Uh, that uh, how politics... Um, starts sometimes with YouTube, and that's the moment that uh, sometimes unauthorized or authorized the campaign videos change the lives of the candidates, politicians. So uh, these are uh, becoming very important tools nowadays. Few uh, statistics from Obama's uh, Facebook campaign with Mc McCain's uh, supporters, Facebook. Uh, amazing statistics. Obama has 380% more supporters than McCain. MySpace is basically gone. I don't think it's uh, basically, I, I don't use it. I don't think you, how many people use MySpace by just curiosity? Or oh, just one or two. It's just gone, basically it's dead. It's a dead company. <laughs> so um, then it was strong, but not, not anymore. Uh, so things have changed. It is powered, you know, the advertisement. Facebook, did you know that Facebook is the biggest advertising company now? Facebook, and uh, this is amazing for you to learn that anytime you push like, they're gathering information about you, what you like. They're going to advertise those things for you. Anytime you search something in Google, they're gathering information. I'm not saying in a bad way. Sometimes it becomes a bad way. But they know Google. Did you know that those people who use, how many people use Androids? Raise your hand. Did you know Google follows you wherever you go? They know your location? Did you know that? Yes. They know where you are. They do research, gather data. And sometimes they use it in your favor, sometimes they use it against you. So it could be sinister. So this is amazing time that you just without realizing what you like, what you research, somebody is collecting information about you. And they're going to use somehow, um, one way or another. Look at the number of searches for McCain and uh, Obama uh, in different times. That gives you, uh, again, the power of uh, social media and um, internet in uh, politics. Um, so it's no surprise uh, that Facebook has become the must-have tool in arsenal of politicians, both uh, in office and uh, in campaign uh, trail. And um, looking uh, to stir up grassroots support, increase voters' turnout, and election day. You, you can see that how these tools are used uh, nowadays. Well, that's the positive part. These social media tools also can be very destructive. Some politicians may use sexting, and they can ruin their lives. Let me give you one example here. Does anyone know who this person is? Raise your hand. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, you've been in my Turkey seminar, right? Not this year. Not this year. Uh, let's see. What hands are off? You raise your hand too? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hands down, hands up quickly. Oh, I saw that, gen uh, that young lady. Yes? Uh, who? Weiner, Anthony Weiner, yes, yes, it is Anthony. Where is he from? New York. New York, New York. What happened to him? Huh? 
Yeah. He was sexting a few pictures of himself. Uh, the youngest Democratic, I believe, uh, member of Congress with prominent career had to resign, <coughs> leave the office because social media, power of social media. So you can see that how it destroys. Anyhow, I just want to get your attention that how it could be constructive. It can be also destructive too. So let's get, uh, shift the discussions to uh, social media in the Middle East because, of course, this meeting is about um, Middle East. I don't know if you've been following the news. Recently, when you look at the news, they talk about uh, Arab Spring. Arab Spring. Spring means revolution here. means that countries, that Middle East, use the social media, started with the country of, uh, which country was the first one to go? The one dynasty uh, collapsed by the power of social media in, um, in the Middle East. Huh? Tunisia, yes, Tunisia, in the, uh, it's in the screen. The internet, the power of Tunisia that uh, um, uh, the king, the president, uh, the head of state, uh, after 30 years or so, had to uh, leave the office. You see that people are using their laptops, uh, smoking a hookah pipe in the Middle East, trying to know uh, what happened. And in Egypt, the second country was Egypt. And uh, the president of this country, after 35 or two years, had to resign and leave the office. And uh, they tried to cut off the internet, <coughs> cut off the access. So people uh, tried to find the different ways to get the information protest, bring the internet back, and try to, to uh, do their uh, research. You can see how this has become so important in the Middle East. If your government shuts down the internet, shut down your government. Uh, so you can see that uh, how um, uh, this uh, media, social media, internet became such a powerful force to change uh, many regimes um, in the internet. This guy's picture that you see here, uh, it says Facebook. Let me see the next slide. Yeah, that's it. That uh, it was floating in the internet for weeks. It was the picture of the day. That how this guy um, uh, thanked um, Facebook. It's saying thank you in Arabic, shokran shabab meser, which uh, means thank you Facebook, that uh, was finally they were able to change the regimes. So it's a vehicle for democracy, freedom of speech, in Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Bahrain, and many other countries, we saw the impact of this social media that the regimes have changed and became a, a, a very powerful tools. When Egypt cut off the internet, uh, Google and Twitter created a number in the United States, Italy, and uh, Syria, people can call and text and somehow to connect to the, the internet through the phone or something. It's just a technological thing. So keep in touch because uh, Egypt didn't want to, um, uh, people, people to keep uh, connections through the internet because they were collapsed, the regime was collapsing. With a stone, uh, they wrote uh, Facebook uh, in Egypt, the picture. The gra uh, graphics on, on the wall, uh, again, the importance of a Facebook. Egypt, again, the picture of the wall. And you can see, um, again, uh, talking about the Facebook, that how important it is. And uh, Mubarak shift delete, uh, that's another new language we use uh, with the internet. Offline, again, you can see. Um, and um, this was the Twitter uh, message that mission accomplished, thanks to all uh, brave young Egyptians, so Twitter also. I don't use Twitter, I'm not a big um, Twitter user. Um, I don't know what you can say in 100, 140 characters, but you can say a lot, create links. I'm not against it, but I don't use it, so it's not my type of a thing. So uh, Facebook is more uh, powerful. Uh, look at again the people uh, protesting in Egypt, uh, sorry. Um, uh, and look at again, uh, this is a picture from the Egypt uh, protest, finally uh, caused the regime to go. And uh, Egypt, which was, uh, is still a big American ally, and uh, is the third largest um, 
recipient of the United States aid <coughs> assistance. And uh, first one to make a peace with Israel, yet Mubarak, which was the head of state, couldn't survive and had to leave. So um, Bush is shaking hand with who? who? Does anyone know who the picture is, this person is? It is Hosni Mubarak, Egyptian president. See, again, Obama shaking hands. Uh, look at, the, again, the protest signs, why America always supports dictators. I grabbed this picture um, to a little bit elaborate that uh, what's the reason that we always um, uh, try to, you know, support these, uh, look at uh, our support to Saudi Arabia. Today we speak, we know it's the dictatorship. Some other examples, Saddam Hussein, Shah, Hosni Mubarak, um, uh, Parvez Musharraf, Prince Abdullah, and um, Bin Laden was in the CIA list for a long time, receiving money uh, to fight in Afghanistan against Russians, communists. So uh, this is uh, something that you as a college students in foreign policy, to be knowledgeable that um, why we are doing this. You know, this is very important for you to know. And uh, I find these cartoons or comics that um, uh, exceptions that it is uh, bad uh, if something is bad for Israel, bad for oil, um, and uh, if we like the dictator, if we appoint the dictator, if uh, revolution fails, if um, you know radicals are uh, elected, so uh, we side with uh, freedom in the Middle East. So there are some truth on this grain of truth, yet uh, funny um, in some respects. The question here is, what countries in the Middle East we as a student of political science classify as democratic to support and not to support in terms of our principles? We always preach about liberties, freedoms, statues, and this, that. But uh, Turkey is ally. If you came to my Turkey seminar, there is no debate on that. Israel is also allied. There are a lot of questions about it, but still their political system uh, can be classified democratic. But the rest really are not. There are about 22 countries in the Middle East. And uh, why do we support Saudi Arabia? We know it's monarchy, it's dictatorship. We support Bahrain, we support Qatar. United Arab, these are all our friends. We have a navy, we have stations, we have military uh, alliance with these countries. And so uh, this gives you an idea that uh, we want to explore these things, to learn more about these things. There is no question that stability takes precedence over democracy when it comes to the foreign policy issues. So Obama, Bush, any other president before that, Clinton. So we always are after stability. Which country is going, which dictator is going to bring st stability to this country? If Hosni Mubarak is a good guy to bring stability, okay, forget about the democracy. If the Shah of Iran brought th 30 years of stability for, it's short-sighted. You know, when we are short-sighted, we lose the sight, and then we run to a problem. Then uh, other issues arise. So. Obama never uses democracy and Saudi Arabia in the same sentence. This is, um, I thought, um, enlightening for you, summarizes the history of 30 years of um, rule by Hosni Mubarak in um, Egypt about corruption, about poverty, about fear, about torture, about oppression, uh, illiteracy, tyranny, lies, uh, empty promises, um, Mm, fraud, injustice, insult, illegal uh, detention, police state, um, humiliations, and you name it. So it summarizes what happened in 30 years under Hosni Mubarak. So that's what happens to your picture when your picture is, there is a major quotation. If a picture of a ruler is bigger than a paper size, you know the size this, uh, in a country, that means that country's uh, rulers are dictators. That's what happened to Osni Mubarak. That's what happened to Shah. That's what happened to Gaddafi. You mentioned Gaddafi. His picture, Saddam Hussein's huge pictures were in all, all not all, but major squares and so on and so forth. 
So picture has a lot to tell you that um, what happens in that country. Well, these are uh, the people uh, basically gone uh, from Middle East. Gaddafi is here. Uh, Hosni Mubarak is here. This is the uh, Tunisian president and uh, Bahrain. And um, I think um, that's uh, um, Oman's uh, rulers uh, that uh, are um, struggling. So uh, these uh, protest signs sometimes is really telling uh, a lot of stuff just by one uh, simple statements as you uh, read these things. And the denial, denial not the only river uh, in Egypt. So uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook um, uh, played very important role in uprising Yemen. So um, social media has impacted the Middle East. But some countries like China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, did you know that in Iran, it's illegal to have a Facebook account? People go to, through filters and stuff to go to the Facebook to uh, have an account on that. China, there are some restrictions on that. Saudi Arabia is restrictions, they are restricted. Uh, it's not like here that anybody has an account on Facebook. Can you believe that? So it shows the power of these uh, social media that what happens in these countries. So the Middle East has been shaken, and social media have done the sum of this uh, shaking. Facebook, Twitter uh, are changing the Middle East. And uh, it's called the Democracy 2.0, the Middle East shaken <coughs> by these forces. I have already discussed these. So um, uh, mobile devices in countries like Jordan, Yemen, Algeria, Libya, Egypt uh, really uh, had impacted the politics in these countries. Uh, perhaps the graphics, the picture shows that spring that I told you, revolutions that happening, Middle East, North Africa, list of the countries, Tunisia, Egypt, um, Yemen, um, Sudan, and um, Lebanon, Jordan, um, you name it. These are all um, uh, affected by the power of uh, social media. And a uh, few more pictures. I think uh, I loaded you with enough pictures. So protesters in Algeria, Bahrain, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Morocco. Uh, it's just everywhere. Syria, right now Syria is in trouble also. So the new generation and uh, generation of uh, internet is fearless. They want their full rights. They want uh, life, digni dignified life. So it's all thanks to uh, Facebook, Apple, YouTube, Amazon, Google, if they don't have it, I don't need it. I can't find anything I want in these four um, uh, companies. So globally, Google has four billion uh, searches per day from uh, 35 um, billion connected devices. And the Facebook continues to be the number one social networking site. 70 languages, Facebook in 70 languages. And it's actually, I put here 800 million. Today I was reading a report that it's close to a billion. Close to a billion Facebook accounts. Close to a billion. What is the population of the world? Anybody knows? The hand up. Uh, let's see, let's, let's start it. Seven billion. Seven billion, excellent. Yes, you go to Chick-fil-A. I think uh, your girlfriend can enjoy that, yes. $40, uh, enjoy, yes. Seven billion, recently if you've been watching the news, seven billion people uh, in the world. And um, so I have a faith in Google and Facebook, and I say a statement that I Google, therefore I am. And what happens in Las Vegas, this was a statement, probably some of you have heard, it stays in Las Vegas, but what happens in Facebook, it may not stay there. YouTube, you have to be careful what you write, what your pictures you put. Baby is born in Egypt called Facebook. It's funny, yes? You are what you share. Things have changed, you know, the statements. Over the last 10 years, social media has changed your life and my life. Hasn't it? Yes, everybody. You are attached. Every day you want to get the update, apps, and new gadgets. Um, you are connected. You are wireless, yet always you are connected to the rest of the world. So you can see how these things have changed uh, my life. So it's not a one-night stand, you know. Uh, it's a relationship that you are going to stay with it uh, for a long time. 
I told you earlier that Steve Jobs have really um, changed a lot of things in our lives. And I came up with uh, seven things that he changed. PCs, if you use Apple, iMac, and um, animated movies, music, video, iPad, iTunes, digital publishing, smartphones, iPhone, most of you, some of you have, iPad, tablet computers, and uh, these are the things at least I find that how he impacted. So I'm going to use a few quotations from him, perhaps to inspire you uh, after this meeting, that revolutionized seven industries, Steve Jobs. And this is one of the quotes that I really like to use quite a bit. I want to put a ding in the world, in the universe. So I think this should be a motto for you every day, that you want to change somehow in your, you know, with your limitations. And uh, new ways to change the world. And Steve Jobs did not invent the internet, did not invent the iPhone or iPad or iPod. But he looked at the things and new ways to do it. Computers, laptops. So that was the secret for his success, that how do the things differently. Educated people never graduate. And this is another quotation from Einstein, that uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. I want you to have always imaginations about the things you do, about your family, about your education, about your career, that um, it's, uh, don't think always linear. Oh, this is the way people do it, I, I want to do that way. Try to find your own new ways to do the things. Uh, don't think linear. I use this example that if today, if I would have come here, this is again linear thinking, giving you the facts about Middle East. Okay, Middle East size, geography, language, um, you name it, religion, just go over these things and bore you to death. You wouldn't be able to remember these things. But look at, the, again, quotations from Steve uh, Jobs that connecting the dots Creativity is the connection of things. How you connect the things together. That facts become so easy that you don't have to remember how A, B, C, D looks like. It's right there, but you have to have a vision, imagination, see? These are the all things about Middle East, about US politics. This is another quotation that I'm going to use from Steve Jobs, that stay hungry, stay foolish. So don't get education, well, you guys stay ignorant. So um, teaching should be full of ideas and stuff, stuff with facts, you know. That's the reason I'm avoiding uh, every day in my lectures to stay away from the facts. Why? Because you have your gadgets, you have your uh, computers, you can easily get the uh, facts yourself, Google it. It's easy, but the ideas how to get it to shine because of your uh, knowledge, because of your education. So the shining comes from your education. So uh, as a teacher, I have to polish. It's just I'm trying to rub that to everyone so you can shine. Knowledge is power to light and shine. Innovations distinguishes between a leader and a follower. That's the difference. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Very powerful statement. I love these things. Always, you know, we try to be copycats. Oh, so-and-so um, did this, so I want to do my education this way. I want to do my family this way. I want to do my job this way. So try to think in a, a different ways. And this is another advice I give to my also students. I think uh, Steve Jobs uh, also well said that the, the only way to great work is to love what you do. Sometimes students go to a major, oh, what, what do you want to study? Oh, nursing. What do you want to study? Business administrations. Why? Because they are looking after money. They don't like to be a nurse. They don't like to go to a business administration. Not all of them, but some of them. But I tell them, go to a major that you love because money comes. Money comes to you. You don't have to chase the money for a you know, uh, minimum wage. So love what you do, and you will see the results that um, uh, 
how uh, your name can be listed with uh, people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Socrates, <coughs> Beethoven, uh, Picasso, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Einstein, and Steve Jobs, and in the future, maybe Dr. K. Just joke. <laughs> Who knows, yeah. The world is hot, flat, crowded with seven billion people. And there are ways to change it for better. So you as a students, I want you to be an element of a change in studying Middle East, US politics, <coughs> Texas politics, whatever you study. So don't follow always, you know, uh, that linear thinking. So my goal is to make you an independent learner today. So when you leave the room, okay, Dr. K didn't discuss the woman in the Middle East. Well, you can go and Google it. Then once you Google a few pages, you will learn how to do it. The information comes. So that's the way you will learn and you will eventually put your dent on this earth that uh, uh, like you know, the quotations we used from uh, um, Steve Jobs. So anyhow, all these things I preach to you is about um, teaching and learning. So um, uh, I want uh, you think a little bit differently. I took this few minutes, uh, deviate from just facts, and then we get to the facts, we discuss those, we learn a little bit more, that's okay. But I want you to know that where we are heading with this. When uh, researchers uh, study the teaching and learning, this is the result. If I come here, lecture about the facts all day without visuals, probably you will keep 5% of what you heard. Human beings cannot uh, retain, the brain cannot, it's impossible. If I ask you to read, probably about 10%, approximately. Audiovisuals go to YouTube or something, you know, 10% yourself. But really, the best way to learn about something, look at here, teaching something. Volunteer to teach whatever the subject you are interested in. That's what really the best thing happens, practicing, engaging yourself. They have done one studies in California, San Francisco, that in uninterrupted lecture, uninterrupted lecture, when the student came to the room, the heart rate was close to 90. In about 10 minutes or so, they relaxed. In about 20 minutes or so, they got bored. 60 minutes or so, go to sleep. 80 minutes, a coma. Yeah, that's what happens. And if I go on uh, <laughs> further than the flat dip. So that's what happens. So uh, it's, you know, you can see the results that, uh, of um, how we have to get engaged. Teaching, learning is different now. 